now we have um, Peter, who's going to explain about uh, parking tickets and why you should collect them, but not pay them. Your hand for uh, Peter, please. The bad news is that I I got a parking ticket, so can I have a bit of sympathy from everybody? <laughs> I've had I've had hundreds of them. I never paid them. I used to put I used to put. I can't hear. Next year. Yeah, there. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Higher. Yeah. Okay. I I used to put uh, no contract return to sender on all the envelopes, but I stopped doing that. I, I thought it was a waste of time, but. Um, all of a sudden I had a bailiff notice from Bristow and Souter from a ticket I got in Shrewsbury last August. So I thought it's about time to have some fun with them. So I, I started engaging with the council in Shrewsbury and they started telling me all sorts of stuff. Um, so I started to look into the, the forensics of how they claim that they can issue a warrant. So I started digging and I started talking to the Ministry of Justice about it. And um, the upshot was that I got an email from the Ministry of Justice, um, which they, they reckon that this explains what it is that they do and why, and why it is that, they're, that the councils are allowed to issue warrants. And I, I was arguing that in the 1992 1993 regulations, it actually says that it has to be a warrant of theory facious, which in modern language is a warrant of execution. Um, but the Traffic Enforcement Centre and the councils keep arguing that they're allowed to print their own warrants. But I don't actually think they're allowed to. They've, they've set up a system whereby it looks as though it's, it's legal for them to do so, but in actual fact, the legislation says something different. And so what they've told me is that the, the 1993 rules have, uh, uh, and some of the provisions of the 1991 Road Traffic Act have been repealed. And I think what they're trying to tell me is that the requirement that they, that they have a court-issued warrant has been repealed. But I, I somehow don't think that's, that's actually true. Because what she's written to me is, that the Traffic Management Act 2004 has repealed some provisions of the Road Traffic Act of 1991. And um, so I decided to look into that a little bit more. And the, also the civil procedure rules, this was my main argument with them, the civil procedure rules, part 75, which is the part that governs council parking ticket enforcement, it says that a warrant of control, which is the modern term for a warrant of execution, and, and, uh, and the warrant of fury facius, it means a warrant of control issued by a local authority under Article 5 of the 1993 order. But then, then later they're, they're telling me that the 1993 order has been repealed by the 2004 Act. I know, I know it's, a, it's a brain twister, but this is the way that they actually get us to believe that they can, they can do things which they really can't do. So, um, so I, I began to accept that the 1991 Road Traffic Act had been repealed. Um, and he, here it is here. I know this is all a real drag, but knowledge is power. <laughs> So this is under Schedule 12 of the 2004 Act. Road Traffic Act 1991, Section 76 to 79 have been repealed. Well, 70, Section 78 is the section that says they have to issue a warrant. So on the face of it, it looks as though they've repealed the need for them to go to court to get a warrant. But if you then look in the Act that repealed that, which is the Traffic Management Act of 2004, in section 82, it says, the Lord Chancellor may by order make provision for warrants of execution in respect of traffic contravention debts or such class or classes 
contravention debts as may be specified in the order to be executed by certificated bailiffs. So he's actually saying there in section 82.3a that, that there is provision for warrants of execution. Well, that, if I'm understanding it correctly, that means that this Act has repealed the requirement in the Road Traffic Act of 1991 that they have to issue a warrant, and they've repeated it in slightly different words in the Act that they claim is in force now. So my argument with them is that, is that the law, the primary legislation, actually says that they have to issue a warrant of execution. And as I understand it, a warrant is a document that's issued by a court, not something that they print themselves. And sit, sitting inside that distinction, I, I think is they're actually playing fast and loose with proper law in statute. It's nothing to do with common law, it's just statute, statute law. But I, I believe that they are required to go to court to get a warrant. But they keep on arguing, and I've had loads of phone calls with these people, they keep on arguing that the councils are allowed to print their own warrants. But to, I, I don't know if there's anybody here that actually knows anything more about this stuff than I do, and this is all fairly new to me, but it, it seems to me that... Could I just jump in on that one? Yeah, please. Help, help you just follow Please, yeah. Can I just borrow that? Yeah. Uh, that's a very important point that uh, Peter's just made, Peter as well here, so oh, we're almost like twinned. Um, what most people fail to realise is that when people pull you up on statutory legislation, that's the policeman at the side of the road, or um, the county council, or the, uh, the uh, a warrant or the threat that they're going to put you into jail for non-payment of, say, council tax. Um, most of the legislation, around about 98% of all the statutory legislation that lays across your back, is not what's called primary legislation, which Peter mentioned, it's what's called secondary legislation or delegated legislation. Delegated legislation is what's called a statutory instrument that the minister for each relevant department has the authority to pass on behalf of the government uh, on the advice of uh, civil servants in Whitehall. So for example, uh, acts like the uh, Serious Organised Crime and Police Act, amendments to the Road Traffic Act, amendments to these pieces of legislation that I've spoken about, are all pushed through on something called a Henry VIII Clause. And a Henry VIII Clause was something that was a constitutional nightmare and has been consistently argued uh, right the way through 1688 Bill of Rights uh, by, shall we say, uh, constitutional philosophers or people who wanted to protect your rights because what it does is it gives the authority, so called, for Parliament to say that it passed a legislation when in fact it didn't. A classic example is the production of your documents, say your uh, driving license and your insurance immediately at the size of the road um, uh, otherwise you have your vehicle seized. Now anybody looking at the provisions of what's called the 1988 Road Traffic Act would see in whatever section, I think it's section 143, um, if you don't produce the documents immediately the police officer has the right to seize the vehicle there and then, full stop. But as most of us might know who are over say the age of 40, 45, it used to be that you had seven days to produce the documents at the side of the road so, you have a primary legislation, the Road Traffic Act, which has had antecedent legislation welded or grafted back onto it, and therefore what you do is you have the right to challenge the police officer or the court at the side of the road that it wasn't a democratically, um, should we say, uh, uh, statute law that has been imposed upon you, but it's a statutory instrument passed by the will of the minister on advice of some type of civil servant, and therefore you could argue it is not an, uh, uh, an act that has been passed by Parliament. The difference is an act has to go through a first reading, a second reading, a committee stage, it goes to a final reading, then it goes up to the House of Lords, then it gets passed. A statutory instrument lays on the desk in the House of Commons for 40 days, and if it's not objected to, it becomes law. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much.
I, I really appreciate that because it really put, puts into perspective what it is that I'm trying to dig out. There's a lot of stuff in there that I didn't actually realise. And one, of, one of the things that I wanted to bring everybody's attention to is, is where all of this stuff is leading us. Because I've got a screenshot here from the, the Citizens Advice Bureau because what the, what the people in the Ministry of Justice are telling me is that there are some circumstances where the creditor themselves are authorised to issue warrants. Presumably they're talking about councils because this, this is what they do. They issue warrants for council tax and they issue warrants for parking tickets. But, but in many instances they don't even bother printing them anyway. They just tell the values to come round. So they never ever show you any documents. And I believe one of the reasons why they won't show documents is that they know they're fraudulent in the first place. Because, because deep down inside the system, they, they've been suckered in, the, the, the people that are actually doing the jobs have been suckered into thinking that they're acting legally, whereas the people that are instructing them know perfectly well that it, the, the whole thing is completely illegal. Because, because, because this legislation says that it has to be a court-issued warrant. They have to make a request to the court and get the court to agree that there's a warrant. And incidentally, you should be there to argue your case as well with the magistrates or whoever it is that's being asked to issue the warrant. Um, so, but this is where it's leading. The Citizens Advice Bureau actually is saying on, on this screenshot, you, you can't read it, so I've actually typed out the text. How is a bailiff authorised? And what that, what that actually says This, this is Citizens Advice Bureau, they're actually telling the public that some, some creditors must get authority from the court, while others can issue it directly to the bailiff or enforcement officer themselves. Um, but I, I find it absolutely amazing that, that, that things have become so degraded, the actual, the actual proper due process of law even if you consider that statute law applies to us anyway, which most of us don't, but, but they, they, they've got so far from, from due process that, uh, as Guy is frequently saying these days, we're living in the Wild West. They, they've set up a whole system of administration which, which, which basically flaunts the primary legislation, that, that which, is, which has been debated in Parliament presumably to protect us and to make sure that demands aren't made on us that aren't proper. And, and it's become so degraded that the Citizens Advice Bureau itself can actually print this stuff to, to, to kid us into thinking that, that the council or the bailiffs or, or I don't know, a, a bank or whoever it is can actually print a warrant themselves. Now, most of us in this room know that they do this all the time. But here it is in, in actual public print that this is what they're doing very very interesting so I'm at the moment trying to figure out how to bring a claim against the council on the basis that they're not actually following due process um, I'm just thinking of ways to do it and um, as I say it's all all very new to me but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely blown away by the fact that the, the legislation actually says in plain words that they have to have proper warrants issued by courts because warrants and writs cannot be issued by anybody except judges and magistrates. So I think that's pretty much about what I wanted to say. Thanks, Pete. John Doe is going to talk about the new bail of tactics that, uh, that they're producing now. So once again, big hand for John. Thanks, Hans. Can I just check, can you all hear me at the back? Is that better? I will shout a bit because I know this PA is not very loud and we've got quite a lot of racket going on next door. Okay, uh, my name's John. Um, I'll try and fit as much into the 20 minutes that I've got. Um, what I'm trying to pioneer is a new tactic for dealing with bailiffs at the front line, either when they turn up at your property or before they come through writing to you and then you phoning them up or through them getting in contact with you in any other way, shape or form. Um, and how it is, is we need to effectively make the shit stick to that bailiff as a man or woman. Nothing to do with them being a bailiff or an employee or an acting agent for the courts, the council, whoever. Um, I've got a YouTube channel which is uh, 
Derb JD, D E R B J D. Um, I don't know why I called it that, but there it is. Got a couple of new videos on there from this week, and one of them I had a chat with Equator because they're chasing after me for a parking ticket through Birmingham City Council. And getting back to what Peter and Peter spoke about just now, um, there is no provision in this country for a bailiff to obtain a warrant on anything. There is no provision in this country for a bailiff to request audience with a magistrate or judge in order to obtain a warrant of anything at all. The council will write all of these warrants out themselves, as we already know. I mean, there's a lot of us in here that know this fact from upside down and inside out. But for the benefit of the doubt, I'll cover a few basics. The process of a parking ticket or any other type of civil cases, the authority tries to push you into paying for it. So if we look at parking tickets, because that's a really straightforward one, and I've got one of those on the, uh, on the go at the, the moment. The council stick a ticket on your car, you ignore it or do what I did. I actually videoed myself, handed it back to Birmingham Council, saying thank you very much, no contract, there you go. A few weeks later, they send out a letter, then they send out another letter. And you can ignore them and some of them might go through and sneakily get a county court judgement behind your back, yeah. which you can fight in another way, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, it's alright, bear with me, I'm running on caffeine and pure faith today, because I've had about two hours sleep last night, which is why I'm all rosy cheeked. So, getting back to the fact that bailiffs have never got authority, it's going to be a case of fighting that bailiff as a man and putting a warning to them which needs to kind of, we want to go for their consciences really rather than anything else because if a bailiff turns up, they'll hide behind their corporation, they'll hide behind the business that they work for, I'm an acting agent of so and so and I'm from the court so and so, obviously they're not. So this is the scenario, a bailiff comes to my property for example with whatever type of warrant he's got, we know them as EX96 forms. That's all it is, it's not a real warrant. The reason is, is because in a civil case, magistrates and judges will never sign and state, uh, sorry, sign and seal a real warrant of execution or arrest or anything because it's not criminal law. You'll never get a real warrant with a judge's signature with their full human being name written underneath it because that means that if they did, that magistrate or judge is accepting liability in the matter. Should they be wrong, you can countersue or prosecute them under criminal law because obviously it's fraud in the first place. Why is it fraud? Because none of you have ever signed a contract to the council to say, oh yes, I'll pay a parking ticket should I get one. Gladly. Nobody does that, so there is no contract. Everything civil law, there must be a signed contract between the two parts. It's preferably a wetting, but these days a lot of people do things through email or through PDF. Okay, so the scenario, a bailiff turns up at the door. Hello Mr Bailiff. Let's see your paperwork then. Oh no, they won't show the paperwork. They keep the original, allegedly, back at the office. Of course they do. So, you ask them, where's the court, se uh, where's the court seal? If you're not aware, Real warrants have got a waxy corner or a square area of the paper which is squeezed through a machine and it will emboss the court logo seal onto the real warrant. Are you with me? Like an old MOT certificate, the garage would squeeze the paper through a machine and it would put the name and address of the garage on there to kind of authenticate it as a true document. That's what you have with a real court warrant under criminal law, never under civil. So that's the first thing missing, there's no seal. Then when it gets to the signature bit, you've got a scribble that you can't understand. Whose name is it? Nobody knows. Are they a real person? Probably not. Is it a PDF graphical um, signature? Or is it done in wet ink? Usually the former. Underneath that, what it will say is, Justice of the Peace. Who is Mr. or Mrs. Justice of the Peace? They do not exist. The reason they don't exist and the reason no actual human being will put their name to a fraudulent document or warrant is because that's putting them in accepting liability in the matter. So that of course they could be prosecuted back by you because they're acting fraudulently. 
So, getting back to the bailiff on the doorstep, what I do, and I'm asking for opinions on this from people that know a lot about all these sorts of things as well, because I want to cover all tracks basically, I want to make sure that I'm not putting myself up for liability, but this is how it goes. Number one, the bailiff has got two options. Firstly, they disappear, they pass the matter back to whichever authoritative body gave it to them in the first place to act on, usually the council or whoever. A different human being this time might pop down and have another knock on the door, but you can give them the same two options. So that's option one. Take the matter back, pass it back to the authoritative body, and I don't want to deal with you, thank you Mr. Much third party interloper. Option number two. You stay on my doorstep and threaten me, harass me, try and push past me, try and levy goods rather than take my property, because obviously there's a bit of legalese in here. They always talk about goods, they never talk about property, because your property is your property. But they can levy goods to uh, cover the, the bill. Bill? Invoice, sorry, or notice, or CPS, or whatever they call them. So you stay on my doorstep and you give me trouble, harass me, try and break in, go round the back, try and open the patio doors, whatever you want. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to utilise the resources of you guys, the people that we've got are, what, 25,000 members and growing now, I think, between Response UK, Beat the Bailiffs and the Banks, Get Out of Debt Free .org, and all the other associations that bring us here today. I'm going to use the resources to my advantage and what I'm going to do is I'm going to find out all about you, Mr. Bailey. I'm going to find out who you are, where you live, your family members, the car you drive, the job you do, the people you work for, everything. Your days as a bailiff are numbered, my friend, because we are shutting you all down, as you can see. So, when I've got this information on you, and it only took us a few days to find out who Cliff Hales was, come all the way from Prestat in down to try and take Tom's house off him, got them all stuck down in the corner of the cul-de-sac, shitting themselves in two cars, got to sweat on, one of them picking his nose and eating it on video, that was me that videoed that, sorry if you're eating your dinner. Oh, it was brilliant. Oh, what a day. Tom, thanks for that piece. That was brilliant. I know the circumstances are rotten for you and everything, but what a day. Anyway, so, we find out everything about these bailiffs. Then what we do, it's only a matter of time until they get laid off, because bailiffs aren't going to be able to exist very long after we finish with them. Give them a couple of years at most, probably less than that, because the election's coming up, so there'll probably be some sort of civil unrest and everything. Just a minute. So we find out everything about Mr. Bailey. What we do then is we broadcast and tell everybody, their friends, their family, using only the video and audio evidence that we've collated so that we're covering our own arses against defamation of character or slander. We use the video footage. We broadcast it to every single future employee, sorry, future employer, that that bailiff as a man goes to when he's finished being a bailiff, works in an office, shop, any occupation whatsoever. We get in touch with that boss, we tell them, you've got a crook working for you and we don't appreciate that. We give them a strong recommendation that they sack or terminate the employment of that bailiff and we show them the video footage evidence in the public domain by emailing them the YouTube footage. Simple as that. It's in the public domain. Then what we do is we make this strong suggestion that they terminate employment with them and if they don't, we could give them an or else clause. Or else we will protest against your company until you do. This business here, I don't know, paper shop up the road for example, this business here is harbouring a criminal and here's all the evidence of what they've been doing. Bullying people, stealing from people, taking people's possessions, leaving people in the middle of town centres with cars with clamps on, cars being taken away, seven, eight hundred quid upwards just to get their car back when it was a 60 quid ticket. I don't think so. So we boycott those new employers of Mr or Mrs X bailiff until they get sacked. And we build a database 
that automatically keeps updating with when we find out who these bailiffs are as men and women, where they live and work, national insurance, deed poll, um, what's the, what we've got, national insurance, deed poll, uh, DBLA records, birth certificate records, and electoral roll. We can get all that data about them. Simple as that. Take us a few days to find out the information. That ex-bailiff, or bailiffs, as we like to say, because we're going to get them all, they then end up jobless, broke, out of work, ruined reputation, ruined families, because they can't afford to keep the house, they can't afford to keep the kids in school and clothes, and they can't afford to run the car just like what they're doing to people like us. You know? They end up up Shit's Creek. And then eventually what we'll do is we'll tell Mr. or Mrs. X Bailiff, as a human being, we promise to stop boycotting your future employment on the proviso that you go on video camera make a formal apology for your actions as a bailiff stating the date from and to that you were a bailiff give examples of people that you picked on or don't or just refer to the video footage because we'll get the tape of their apology and we'll edit it all in to show that footage so that we'll be able to back it up with the claim that ex-bailiff then apologises on camera we use that as a good example of what's to come for all the other bailiffs that turn up and start harassing people because we'll collect their information and it'll be their turn next. Okay? When we've got their apology, we can write to them to the effect that we promise, and we do it by affidavit or whatever type of document they require, we promise not to prosecute you for admitting that you've been uh, causing fraudulent harassment and all the rest of it, because we've got your apology on video and we're going to broadcast that because that is humiliation and that shit sticks and what will happen from that point onwards is they can go off and change their name by deed poll and then go and find a job and they can be a good citizen they can pay back into the community they can realise what they've been doing wrong in bullying, harassing, stealing, all the rest of it from people and they've been marked off the list but for all those bailiffs that don't want to apologise, we could freely keep our database going. Oh look, Mr. Ex-Bailiff Smith Johnson, whoever, he's moved from Liverpool, he lives in Hull now. Oh great, does he? Right, okay, well what we'll do then is we'll have a look and see where he turns up his employment in Hull. Because da -da -da, we can get the national insurance records from HMRC and all over the place. Because we've got people with access to all that. So then we find out their employer and then we send them an email with the YouTube links and off we go again. Mr. Bailiff that's moved from Liverpool to Hull, for example, trying to hide from his past. Oh no. Well, I'm afraid the internet's everywhere, guys. You're not going to hide from us. How many video cameras have we got in this room already? How many people are there here? About 60? So that's 60 mobile phones plus a few video cameras that are running as well. We will always have video footage of everything. Never be afraid of bailiffs. Do not open your door to them if you're not strong enough or hard enough or what have you to actually confront them and deal with them and stop them from pushing past you. Do film everything, and I mean everything. Know your technology is something that I put up on the groups a few weeks ago. It's no good with an iPhone that's got about half a gigabyte's worth of memory left because you've got all your favourite tunes on there as MP3s and family photos running out of memory or running out of battery. Empty the memory, keep the lens clean, know where the apps are in a hurry if you need them, record everything. Terminate the conversation if your battery dies. Go back in the house and lock the door or if you're inside with a little window open because you don't want to go out there in case they barge past you which is against the rules anyway terminate the, uh, the conversation until you've gone and got a new camera, battery, tape, whatever but film everything, make them accountable for everything because going back to the first thing that I just mentioned that is the evidence that we require in order to continuously prosecute them as a man or woman after they've been laid off or sacked or they've quit being a bouncer how does that sound for shit sticking? 
Do we agree? Because I don't know about you guys, but frankly I've had enough. I'm waiting for Equity to turn up on a parking ticket for Birmingham and I'm not going to pay them a single penny as you can probably tell. And I've had this phone call with conversation with them the other day and it's on my YouTube channel. I think it's called uh, Phone Call to Exit, uh, Equita, Conversation with Robbie, brackets Robber, in you know. And I don't think that anybody's going to turn up, but if they do, I mean, it's going to be great because I'll film them and then we'll have a bit more fodder. Quite simple as that, really. Um, let's see if there's anything else I need to know. Parking, um, there's a worry about you having your car towed away or clamped. You go into city centres, what have you got? You've got car parks run by NCP, you've got car parks that have got those barriers for height of vehicle restrictions that can be conveniently shoved out of the way with a lock. They just turn around, don't they? So they let vans and fire engines and all the rest of it through. You park your car in there, you come back, your car's gone, you call the police, they say, oh no Mr Smith, your car's not been stolen, your car has been taken away to a pound and that's going to cost you £700 to get it back. Car Park Defence 101. Don't use a car park, use a multi-storey car park. Park your car up inside a multi-storey car park. If you can find an end of a row where there's a wall and then maybe where the ramp goes up to the next level, park it in a corner so that you can turn your steering wheel towards the wall if you've got a, a front wheel drive automatic, unfortunately you've got to put it in park so your front wheels are going to be locked as well so it will skid backwards rather than turn into the wall if they try and tow it out. But they won't be able to get in there to put anything underneath it. They won't be able to get their van up there in the first place. So there'll be no more car park theft of uh, your car on the back of a tow truck waving it goodbye while you're down the Sunday market. None of that. Multi-storey car parks Know how to park your car properly with the steering turned towards a wall. If you can make it so that if you've got like a back wheel drive car or a manual gearbox car, your front wheels should stay disengaged, your handbrake will do your back wheels, and wherever they try to tow the car because they can't get to the front, because you parked it inwards properly, it'll turn and it won't go up on the, uh, what do you call it, the winch. So yeah, know your technology. Uh, blank your tapes or memory cards, tapes, cards to sound like, oh, back in the day, the edges. Um, blank your discs and your memory cards, charge your batteries up, clean your lenses. There's a couple of good apps you can get for the iPhones. One's called um, TSA, Tango Sierra Alpha. Little old fashioned microphone logo. You press it, put a code in. You get a nice blank screen, you tap it once, you switch your phone off, you've now got an audio recorder that can't be stopped until you've gone through the original passcode to get into your phone and the passcode to get into that app so it's discreet. That's a great one for courtrooms, that one is, folks, because your phone's off. It's called TSA. Uh, Bambusa. Who's uh, familiar with Bambusa? We've got a show of hands. Yeah? If you go to bambooster.com and then click on what's broadcasting live at certain times a day, if you click the UK link, nine times out of ten, you'll find some fracking po protests going on. Because frackers love Bambooster. What it is, is it's a live broadcasting app for audio and video. You have an account set up, you're all password protected, it all goes off to the cloud, and as soon as you hit record on your iPhone, it's recording to the memory of the iPhone under password, but it's also broadcasting the whole lot off to the cloud account and broadcasting live onto Bambooster if you so wish. So there'll be no snatching of your phone, there'll be no snatching it, confiscating it, trying to tread on it, crush it, stick it in water, none of that. Because up to the point where the phone battery dies, or up to the point where they smash it or chuck it in a river, everything is recorded. Bambooster. B A M. B-U-S-E-R and it's free. You only pay for Bambusa if you're a corporation whee, and you've got a uh, 24 hour video surveillance running through it because you're a boss that wants to go on holiday but you can't quite leave the office because you, you don't trust your staff. Oh no, I'll stick an iPhone up in a cupboard with a glass door and then I'll uh, log on to Bambusa while I'm in Tenerife see whether they're working or not. 
that's the bad side of it. The good side of it is that we can use it for backup. It's great if you get stopped by the police and you do the under what law officer with your doors locked in your window down an inch. So they smash the window and drag you out of the car. Doesn't matter because if you put that app on, there's a. I don't know whether it works properly on an iPhone, but on other app, like uh, Samsung Galaxies and all the rest of those formats. If you have Bambusa app, I think you can switch the phone screen off so that it doesn't appear to be doing anything. So, Mr. Policeman puts your phone in his pocket or sticks it in the car in an evidence bag if they ever bother to do that these days, and it's recording everything. And it's broadcasting it so it doesn't matter if you don't get your phone back straight away because you could just go off and do it. Uh, log on to Bambusa get the evidence that you want and you bang them to run. It's best if you can free up as much memory on the chip inside the phone as you can. If you can get 16, 32 or 64 gig smartphone, you're winning. You don't have to have it on 1080p, 720p is plenty. 640 by 480, low quality is even better. Doesn't show everything, not very good for screens of text and whatnot, but you get more video and bang for your books so you'll be able to record longer. But with Bambusa, it will broadcast it and save it live and even if you uh, don't manage to stop the tape or stop the recording as soon as it senses that your recording is not feeding through it will automatically truncate the end of the file and then name it as 001 or 002 or whatever so that it's ready to go. use your data allowance to upload to Bambooster so if you're on a pay-as-you-go smartphone make sure that you've got plenty of credit if you're on a contract smartphone Check your contracts and see how much free data transfer you've got because upload the count is the same as download these days. So if you're on a four gig a month package, then Bambusa will be uploading and using your data capacity for the month. Um, which is another good reason why if you don't need to use 1080p or 720p high resolution, just use 640 480 and you'll get more recording time if you're recording to the chip inside the phone and you'll be able to record for longer without having a massive bill from your phone company. Any more questions? Does anybody disagree with the shit stick philosophy? No? Are we all for the shit stick philosophy? Because we're free as human beings to protest with free speech. And if we want to protest a business like the shop down the road because Mr. X Bailey's gone and got a job behind the till there now, and we want him sacking because we've got hard evidence, there's no slander and there's no defamation of character, there's only facts. What do you do with 2,000 photos on the memory of your phone? If it's an iPhone, link it to iTunes and back everything up to your computer, burn a DVD and then you've got them keep safe. If it's another type of phone, you might just be able to plug it into your computer and then drag and drop them off as though it's any old memory card or hard drive. iPhones are a bit particular, you have to go through iTunes if you want to offload them all sometimes. But when as soon as you connect your phone to your computer, you should get an icon pop up in the usual place where hard disk icons are. Double click it, click in and see if you can find the folders. If you don't know where you're looking, if you've got a smartphone with lots and lots of folders of gibberish, just type in, uh, open a window, or if you're on Windows, say, Windows E will open up your Windows Explorer, which is the same as double clicking my computer. C drive, DVD drive, and all the other icons iPhone will be in there, double click it, you'll get a load of folders probably, so do a shortcut to find all your videos or all your photos, go to the find box or search box on that window and just type in JPG for JPEG and then it'll through the phone and it'll just give you every single JPEG uh, regardless of what uh, folder it's in on the phone and if you want to find all your video files on an iPhone type in MOV because they're MOV format, movie format. And then if it's uh, a Samsung Galaxy or something like that that's running Android, it might do your video files as AVIs, AVI, or MPEG-4 or something. Sift through the files, whatever a normal video file is like uh, Marv, AVI, whatever, you can shortcut it by double-clicking your phone icon, search for the file extension JPG, MOV, AVI, whatever, and then you can just get them all Select all, copy, go to the hard drive on the computer, paste, make sure that you've got everything that's precious to you, and then wipe the memory on the phone. I've got two minutes left before I finish. Any more questions, anyone? Right, I think so. Thank you very much. There's absolutely brilliant. Uh,
at the, at the end of the talk there, it was a strange language. I mean, uh, I've still got quite... I'm still trying to get the tipex off my screen on the computer because uh, <laughs> I don't know what it's talking about. Roger Bingley took us to court to uh, possess our home and um, Guy who's here has a, a lot of knowledge about the same subjects that I'm about to talk about. So the very first thing they do is send you out a, uh, a claim that they want to take your property. This is what... Uh, okay, they came after our house on the 17th of August 2012. As you can see, case record um, created. Now, we had a hearing. Um, you can see all the different uh, things we actually did and, and went to court about. All then aside, this is called the case in the file. This is the, the, the documents that um, the court don't want you to have and certainly their solicitors don't want you to have. Guy's talked about this quite a lot, but this is uh, Sue and I's. As you can see, um, I put in an affidavit, I paid uh, to have the uh, kicked out, null and void, cost me £50. There should be another amount in there that we paid. But this is the case in files that everybody should get, and that's when you, you put in a request uh, under CPR. 5.4.1 and 5.4.2 uh, under your statutory rights and you to request this document within 48 hours of having uh, a written request placed in the court. Should they try and avoid giving you this, it's called concealment, concealment and it's a criminal offence and you notify them should they do that, uh, procedures will be taken against the filing. Um, this is a gentleman who I have to uh, give a lot of thanks to because he's the only man in that court, including judges, that's actually signed any documents. So thank you, Mr. King. And uh, it's ironic that the judge I'm going to see is called God, Mark. Yeah. So we've got a God in this place and we've got a King. There's, there's a lot of uh, information here. There, there is also a fee written down there that uh, we paid, uh, I must have gone past it, which is 100 and 75 pounds and that was uh, to take a case out against them for them to remove their fraudulent claim of our property so at the beginning for them to start this case what they've got to do they've got to put in a claim into court they've also got to put in another document well actually the, the court have to put this other document in which is this is a notice of issue on this document, it, um, it gives all the information, uh, the claims number, the claimant, and the defendant, and the issue fee. With ours, it doesn't exist at all. And the reason being is because there's two cases being run at the same time. There's one case, which is uh, the documents you find in your file, and there's a, there's a secret, a shadow court, that's going on, that all these documents will be found in. You won't find these because the claimant it gets issued from the court and they don't notify you. And as you can see, there's acknowledgements, there's uh, uh, if you dispute it. And this document, they try their best not to issue to anyone. I'm, I'm speeding up here because there's quite a lot of information. The main one um, that you should all see, and I'll blow this up nice and big. So you go, they they go to court, they put in a um, a claim, and then they pay a fee, and then the judge puts out an order for a warrant. And from that warrant, uh, they come for your property. They don't give a proper um, claim in. You see that? See it? No case payment has been made for this case. And that's right at the very start. 
the hunt paid to do anything. This case should not have even been considered by the court. I consider it like um, going for a, a warrant or to possess somebody's home is like catching a bus. What they've got to do, you go into the, the station and you request a ticket. It's like going in and requesting uh, to take somebody's property. The next thing uh, you have to do to get on the bus, you have to pay for the ticket. As you can see, they paid nothing to start this procedure. The next thing, the, the conductor would say, get on, get on the bus for your journey. And when you get to the end of the journey, uh, that would be the end of the point where they got the warrant. But that order was not given by a judge to start it. So there shouldn't be a warrant. So the whole procedure is totally fraudulent. The Bradford and Bingley's uh, solicitors wrote and said, uh, a very nice letter, one paragraph uh, about my skeleton argument, next paragraph about something else, and then right at the bottom it said, Oh, exhibit um, C. We, we we require. Where did you get this information by return of post? They're extremely worried because we've got this document. So, as I said, everyone under CPR Rule 5.4.1 and 2 get this document, and they can't stop you from getting it because it is your document. I've, oh, I'll, I'll finish up on, on that a little bit because we, we can't go too much into the case because it's coming out in not March, in May. So, so um, uh, he brought up a, um, a name. He, he mentioned the citizen's advice. Now, I can tell you something about the citizen's advice. A gentleman, uh, Mr. Nesbitt, contacted us contacted us uh, regarding him being made bankrupt and then taking his, uh, his home. He had an accident, uh, a head injury, and he needed help, and he went to the citizen's advice. The citizen's advice uh, never turned up in the court case. He needed this help because he couldn't speak for himself, and they said they would. He lost the case and they charged him £79,000 court case uh, fees. The citizen's advice has done this. Now they're going after his property and they want to make him bankrupt. Those people are there to help people. What's happening? And we pay, we, I think everybody knows that the solicitors and barristers that come forward do it on their free time, so why are they charging? So, um, this information will be coming out, the, the, the gentleman uh, has given us this information and we'll be publicising it. So, once again, not just Bradford and Bingley, citizen advice, hold your head in your hands in shame, it's, it's disgraceful. So, I think we're coming up to a break now, and uh, thank you so much for listening to everyone that's been so far and uh, let's hope we can get the PA working properly in the, the second half. Oh, half past eight. Half past eight. <laughs> All right, we're back here at half past eight.